to Fruity Knitting. This is episode 102. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. Before we start this episode, we just would like to recognise that some very shocking and deeply disturbing things have happened in the last couple of weeks, leaving people feeling very, very hurt and just simply grieving. And we wanted to say that although we live here in Germany, we're really aware of this and we really feel for people's pain and and we're very upset too and we're very sorry and we just hope that our program today might be able to bring a little bit of peace and comfort into your day and and just brighten your day up a little bit so we appreciate you being here with us so thank you very much yeah yeah so during this lockdown period that we've all been going through we've been increasing our knitting and crafting well, most of us have been increasing our knitting and crafting time, at, but unfortunately for some people that's meant an increase in aches and pains. That's partially probably because there's a decrease in daily ex- normal daily exercise because of the lockdown. Now, three years ago, Carson Demers published his book, Knitting Comfortably, The Ergonomics of Hand Knitting. And we did an interview with him back in episode 31. Now, Carson is a very passionate knitter and spinner himself, and he's also a trained physiotherapist, and he's worked with a lot of knitters who have actually injured themselves through their knitting or crafting. So Carson has kindly agreed at short notice to come back on the show again and to talk about how we can prevent the risk of injury through our knitting and crafting, particularly during these difficult lockdown times. Now, that's the feature interview for today's episode, and I think you're going to find it really helpful because Carson gives us some fantastic tips and exercises. And as long-term viewers will know, back in 2017, I had to take a complete break from my knitting for three months because I'd developed pains in both of my elbows that just weren't going away. So later on in the program, I'm also going to just tell you a few little things that I did for my recovery that really helped me and just share my experience with you. Yep, but before we go to the interview with Carson, we have our Meet the Shepherdess segment, and today we're going to Prince Edward Island in Canada to meet Janet of Green Gable Alpacas, and she produces really beautiful alpaca yarns. We're also taking a trip to the Rhine River to see some medieval castles in our extreme knitting segment. This area of the Rhine is really particularly beautiful, and it's very famous, and it has some really interesting history, so we're going to hear a little bit about that. I'm going strong with my Martin story project for Andrea and Andrea is on the home straight with her heirloom crochet blanket, which is really exciting. So we're going to start with that in under construction. So I've been really pushing through on my crochet blanket and I'm on the home stretch now. I'm very excited. So I've even made a commitment not to start a new knitting project until I've done the vast majority of this. I haven't quite committed to completely finishing the, the, the blanket before starting a new knitting project, but I reckon I'm edging my way there because it's a big commitment. Well, I'll be watching. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but I'm pretty excited that it's coming on finally. So for new viewers, just very quickly, it's the Bohemian Blooms Crochet Blanket by the UK designer Janie Crow. It comes in a kit with a beautiful book here and it's done in an an assortment of Rowan DK weight yarns. Now last episode I talked in a lot of detail about the whole construction of the blanket and how it's all put together. So if you feel inspired to make this blanket, you might want to go back and watch that. So there are 41 individual pieces in this blanket and last episode I'd completed 28. Since then I've done about eight more and I've started to sew it all together as you can see here. So these gorgeous glamorous flowers go together in a group of nine uh, squares and um, and that, that's the center of the blanket, so the rest of it's going to extend out all around it. But actually, you don't sew them together, you double crochet them together. And I just have to say that I'm always using the UK crochet terminology. Uh, so I apologize to our American viewers, but I've only just learned the UK terminology, so I can't quickly rattle off the American equivalent. So you have to bear with me. Okay, so when I say that these flowers are gorgeous and glamorous, they really are because there's beading everywhere. I don't know if you can see, but I really love the way Janie has used their dark black, but they've got a bit of a greeny tinge to them, these beads here, and they go on the dark green stems in the center of these leaves. They're just so pretty 
and then she uses white beading here on the thick white uh, petals of this big flower. And if you, hopefully you can see it very clearly, but there's three designs here, three flower designs. So you've got the thick white uh, petal flower here in the center, and then in each corner you've got a gorgeous lily, and they're the ones with the beading on their the stems of their leaves. And then these other four flowers here aren't actually flowers. They're butterflies resting on leaves, which is so lovely. <laughs> you can see they're their big wings and their little lower wings. And this one's upside down, but on the lower wings, there's even embroidery. You do embroidery. So I've just learned so many new things to, uh, with this blanket. It's It's been fantastic. Okay, so once these gorgeous glamorous flowers are all put together, you then put the, uh, and you hold it tight like that, mm -hmm. the frames around the outside. So they're four borders actually, and they act as small frames dividing the inside to what's going to happen on the outside and it's also so it acts because they're solid it acts as a stability because this is just lace mesh and it's fairly flimsy but it also is like a resting place for your eyes because this is very busy here all of these motifs are very busy and and decorative and it just divides that with what's going to come on the other side of this small frame. But even though this is meant to be a resting place, if you look at it, it's actually pretty ornate because you can see these little scallops here, they're all done in beading. So that was really fun to do. You, when, you've, when you've put all of the squares together, again, you start with this gray yarn and you thread on 91 beads, first of all. And then you just do a row of double crochet and then you come back and you're doing these gorgeous scallops here all in beading. So that was a new thing to learn. It was a lot of fun. So for me, this whole centerpiece just looks like uh, beautiful flowers floating on a dark sort of grey brown pond because this is the colour sometimes of, of ponds, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So it's a bit like a beautiful country garden. It's gorgeous. Okay, so I have to now do four more of these white flowers here, and then I can start piecing all of the pieces together to finish it. But And that's quite a lot of work. But just when you've pieced all of the pieces together and you think you're nearly finished, there's this really complicated edging that has to go right around the edge. <laughs> so the whole blanket, I think, when it's finished, is going to be about 50 inches squared or 127 centimetres squared. And I just think of like in real estate when when people will go into a house and it just looks so much bigger on the inside than it does on the outside and they say, oh, the house just keeps giving and giving or the house is a TARDIS. Yeah, which, which is a very English reference. Yeah, from Doctor Who. Yeah. Well, this blanket is a TARDIS. It just... <laughs> It keeps taking and taking. <laughs> but actually, no, in the end, you do get something incredibly valuable, which is just this beautiful heirloom blanket. So yeah. I'll, be, I'll be very grateful to finally have it finished. But I do want to quickly go back and talk about my favourite motif, which is this one here, and that's the butterfly resting on the leaves here. So this little design here, Janie says, is probably the most complicated in the whole blanket. And it's just gorgeous. It's it's um, it's called Vanessa, and it's named after Vanessa Bell, who was part of the Bloomsbury Group. And the Bloomsbury Group was a big inspiration for this blanket. And they were a group of musicians, painters, intellectuals, artists, who were around in the early 20th century. So it's called Vanessa after Vanessa Bell, but the word Vanessa actually is of Greek origin and also means butterfly. So that's kind of cute too. So it's just got a fantastic 3D effect to it because of all of its layers. And I feel, so I thought I'll film myself making it so that you can see how it's put together. Now, it does take me over three hours to make one. So don't worry, you're not going to sit there for three hours Real watching time. me do <laughs> every single stitch. It's just a couple of minutes, but I thought you'd find it interesting to see how it's put together. So that's coming up right now, and then we'll see you on the other side. There are four really beautiful flower patterns in the Bohemian Blooms crochet blanket and they've all got gorgeous names to go with them. So this one's called Harmony, this is Legacy, Virginia 
and Vanessa. Now each one of them is very beautiful but the design Vanessa here is especially gorgeous to me because it has a butterfly resting on a group of leaves. And Janie has designed it so well because crochet loves to curl up at the edges. So all of the leaves are attached at their tips to the framework behind them to prevent them from curling up. But Janie doesn't sew down the butterfly wings and they just slightly curl inwards, which makes the butterfly more lifelike. Janie says that the Vanessa pattern is probably the most complicated one out of the Bohemian Blooms blanket. It certainly has got a lot of layers to it, as you can see here, but it's constructed in such an interesting way and it has a great 3D effect. So I thought I'll just take you through how the pattern's put together. You start off with the butterfly itself doing that separately, and which I've already done here. And I'm up to doing the bullion stitches here in dark pink. You can see that there's four of them there and you do those in embroidery. Next I'm going to make the four green leaves that the butterfly is resting on, so these ones here. The leaves are made by making the stems first in the dark green and then you work the leaves themselves. So the dark green stems uses the Rowan Soft Yuck colour in pasture and the leaves are worked in the Rowan Felted Tweed in avocado. You need to make four stems in between each of the four butterfly wings and they're joined to each other behind the wing with a chain, you can see that there. So that's the framework and on this framework I'm going to be working the next set of leaves. So all four of the dark green stems have been completed and now I have to work the light green leaves around the stems. So you always work with the right side of the butterfly facing you and you just have to pull back its wings and work behind them. So that's where I attached my light green yarn and on this side down here of that chain and then I work a light green chain to the other end of the chain, attach it there again and then I start working up and around the stem in just a series of half trebles and trebles and then I work back down the stem and attach it on that this side of the chain, work another chain down here to the other side of the chain and then work that stem and then continue around. And so you're working around in a circle and that's how you do it. All eight leaves have been finished. The four green ones on top and the four beige ones underneath that. They look so pretty. So next up is this dark pink circle that runs behind all of the leaves here. That's done in the Rowan Summerlight DK, which is 100% cotton. But again, I wor always work with the right side of the butterfly facing me, and I just pull back its wing and the green leaf, and then I start, you can see I've started here with five trebles with the pink yarn, and I'm gonna do all of these trebles in the chain spaces that I have just created in between doing the, the beige leaves. If I turn this one over, you can see that very clearly. So they're all of, all of the groups of trebles and there's chains in between them. And those chains serve as a framework for the next layer to be worked on. I've completed the circle of hot pink trebles that goes underneath the butterfly and the leaves. If I pull back the wing and the leaves, you can see them. So it's a group, they're little groups of five trebles with chains in between going all the way around. There they are on the other side. And if I turn it upside down, you can see it very clearly. Groups of five trebles joined by chains. Okay, so the next thing I have to do is work on the lace mesh that surrounds the leaves and the butterfly. So you can see right up close here, there's just a soft gray and then it goes to a darker gray around the outside. So these two grays are still the, Ro the Rowan Summerlight DK. The light gray is the mushroom and the dark gray is the steel. So I'm going to start with the mushroom and I attach it there on, on top of the, the hot pink trebles and I'm just doing a series of chains. They're like chain loops and they join all the way around. 
Now I'm up to the dark grey mesh and what I have to do here is also work in the tips of each leaf because you can see that each tip has been attached to the grey mesh and that means that the leaf will lie flat and not curl up. So there's the beautiful butterfly finished. Those two just look perfect together. I need to make four in total. So we're back in under construction, my turn. And again, this week it is the Celestial Top by Martin Story. Now, if you look at this, you might think, well, I haven't made any progress whatsoever since last episode, but actually this is the second sleeve that I'm halfway <laughs> through. And in the last episode, I was halfway through the first sleeve. So that means that I've actually knitted an entire sleeve from one episode to the next. Which is faster than what you used to do. Well, I'm impressed, but I'm always impressed. Anyway. <laughs> I thought, well, if I've knitted a whole sleeve, how many stitches is that? <laughs> Andrew thinks I'm crazy. But I don't I think I should encourage him here. Yeah. You yeah. get two minutes. <laughs> All right. So I did indeed calculate how many stitches in this sleeve. Now, it's a three-quarter length sleeve, which is really good, a little bit less stitching there, and it is a size small. Uh, and there are no modifications, at least as far as I'm aware. Um, so it's pretty standard sleeve shape, pretty easy. So I actually wrote down every single row that I did on this sleeve and I know how many stitches, I know where all the decreases are. So effectively I know how many stitches on each row. So for my first calculation, I went through and, and really just added that up. That sounds pretty awful, but I did some little shortcuts and whatever. And I came to a figure of 11,000 stitches. I didn't actually think beforehand how many stitches I expected. So I didn't really know. Um, whether that was going to be right or wrong or I thought it was a lot or not. So it was 11,000. I, I wasn't sure whether it was right. So I did do a second calculation. And for that, I really, I didn't look at what I'd actually knitted. I just looked at the pattern and the gauge in the pattern and the shape of the sleeve. And I just did some rough sort of area based calculations. I tuned out for a minute. I hope this is leading somewhere. <laughs> well, the result of that was I actually got a figure about 500 stitches less than when I did the careful calculation based on my knitting. I think the difference there was partly because it was just a rough calculation, but also there's a section where it says knit until it's this long. And I think my row gauge is slightly tight. And that means that I did a couple of extra rows and that added a few stitches to mine. So now you know, 11,000 11, stitches in your sleeve. I think you're overthinking. I hope you appreciate it. The sleeve. <laughs> I do, I do at least. appreciate it. If, if not but the I calculation. If your if your mind is going to all those calculations, then we've got to get you off stocking stitch and, and oh, back onto some difficult I'm, patterning. I'm really thriving on stocking stitch. <laughs> yeah, but I don't want to hear about calculations and right. stitches. No more stitch counts. Um so that's that. There was one other it's thing which good. I thought Look. yeah, looks looks beautiful. There was one other thing which was interesting for me about this sleeve, and that is if you look at the schematic. You got the shaping for the Reglan, I always forget yeah. the name, Reglan neck sleeve cap. The top of the sleeve cap is not horizontal. There's a little angle on it. And I didn't understand this right from the start, but the reason for that is the neck is higher at the back than at the front. And this little angle gets you from one to the other nice yeah. and neatly so that everything sits straight. So this is the front with the beautiful lace panel. And there's the black, it's the back, it's just straight stocking stitch. And there's this is the sleeve in the middle and it's going slightly up yeah. in that direction. Yeah, which is really cool. Um, I don't know if all sort of raglan patterns do this. You good said, ones do. Yeah, I haven't. <laughs> From good designers like Martin Story. Yeah, I'm not sure whether I've looked at another raglan pattern, so I couldn't say. <laughs> I thought it was fun. The other thing, which is really just very important, is it does mean that your two sleeves are different. Yeah. Don't just knit the same thing twice and make sure you knit the right sleeve into the right spot. Yeah. Or it's, You'll be very warm. Sew it in, which yeah, you've done. In, yes. You've done well. Yeah. So I have sewn it in um, using the trusty family back stitch. It's looking good. It is. It's looking gorgeous. I, I do think it's reasonable now to ask whether I will be finished in the next episode. Well, we could maybe. open a book. I mean, you've we got take bets. <laughs> take bets. <laughs> will he be finished? Well, you've got to finish that. You yeah. can't take any any breaks. You've got to sew it all up. Yeah. And then you've got to knit. Pick up and knit. Yeah, right and then it's got to be blocked before I wear it. But maybe you'll see Blocking. me in it, which takes, you know, a good day. 
Yeah. So maybe you'll see me in it next episode. That would be yeah. exciting. I hope it's cool weather. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. That's my celestial. I think it's going to be great. It's beautiful. Anyway, um, it's now time for Extreme Knitting, and we're going to Rheinfels Castle. Now, the name Rheinfels means Rhine Cliffs, and this castle is indeed located in the cliffs on the bank of the Rhine River. And actually, the castle only exists because of the river. And we'll see why soon. But because of that, we're going to take a look at the rivers around this area before we look at the castle. It's castle. Castle. <laughs> the Rhine starts in Switzerland and it travels in a roughly northerly direction. And at times it forms parts of the borders between Switzerland and Liechtenstein, then Switzerland and Austria, then Switzerland and Germany. And then it's part of the border between Germany and France. And then it heads north through Germany before heading west into the Netherlands and then out to the North Sea around Rotterdam. And just to put us fruity knitting into that picture, we live in Offenbach am Main, and that means Offenbach on the Main River. And in this map here, you can see the Main flows into the Rhine River right about the middle of the map. So the Rhine is the second longest river in Central and Western Europe. The longest river is the Danube. Now the Danube starts in southwest Germany and it heads in a roughly southeasterly direction, travels 1800 miles through I think it's 11 countries before finally reaching the Black Sea just off uh, Romania. You can see again on this map, you can see the Danube we've got marked in red and the Rhine is marked in green. And again to give you a little bit of context, our daughter Madeleine is now living in Ulm and that's located on the Danube River. So rivers have always formed a natural network for transport um, long before there were any significant road or, or obviously rail networks. And so these two rivers, the Rhine and the Danube, were incredibly important for transport and for trade in Europe. And castles like Rheinfels were built along the rivers really to take advantage of uh, these trade routes in the Middle Ages. So Rheinfels was built in 1245 and it served as a toll castle. So that meant that any cargo ships traveling upstream along the Rhine would be stopped and they had to pay a toll both to be allowed to pass, but also at least supposedly to get protection along that section of the river. Here's a picture of Rheinfels Castle. Now Rheinfels Castle was extended over time to become the largest castle on this stretch of the Rhine. And in the 14th century, another castle was built on the opposite bank from Rheinfels Castle. Now this castle was called Neu Katzen Ellenbogen Castle, which is quite a mouthful. And the translation of that is New Cat's Elbow Castle. <laughs> that sounds like a strange name, but the explanation there is that it was named after the owner and his name was Count William II of Katzen Ellenbogen. So Count William II of Cat's Elbow. So it was actually he who had the strange name. The castle was just called My New Castle. Because it was his latest castle. That's right. That's it was so his funny. new castle. He's an interesting fellow himself, Count William II of Neu Katzen Ellenbogen, or Katzen Ellenbogen. Um, he, I don't know the story exactly, but it's something like he introduced Riesling to, the to, area. to Germany, to this area, right? Okay. And Rhine Riesling is like one of the most famous wine. Yeah grapes or wine varieties in yeah. the world now. So it's amazing how these stories come together. Anyway, these two castles, oh, that, that castle was commonly known as Cat's Castle. Mm -hmm. they, they abbreviated it way back hundreds of years ago and it's still known as Cat's Castle. The two castles, Rheinfels and Cat's, worked together and they actually covered, so Rheinfels would get upstream traffic and hit them with a toll and then Cat's Castle would get them on the way down and hit them with another <laughs> toll and they cooperated to make that work. That was known as a double toll. And I said it was called Cat's Castle. There is actually another castle just a couple of hundred metres downstream and I think we've got a picture of it. This castle is called Mouse Castle. So I think somebody did have a sense of humour there too. <laughs> So owning a castle on the Rhine could be a really lucrative business in the Middle Ages. In addition to collecting this toll just to be allowed to pass, ships could be forced to unload their cargo and offer their goods for sale in the town market. And this could be a costly business. You were forced to unload the, the ship using the town crane, which I think was managed by the castle or the you know Count William or whoever it might have been. Uh, and then you had to offer your goods for sale at the town market. Again, I think the castle got a bit of a, a commission on that. I don't think you got to set your own prices. And all of this, this was called Stapelrecht, which is roughly stacking right. That was the law that let you do this. 
it normally went for about three days. So if you're a trader, you're losing some of your goods at a price that you don't necessarily agree with and it's taking you time. So it's all pretty difficult. And I think often enough, the traders would say, let me just make an arrangement with you and they would pay their way out of their obligation. So it was pretty tough. And it was particularly tough when you think on this section of the Rhine, there was a castle every three miles, two miles. I know. It's so, the middle <laughs> Rhine. And you can, you can actually see them on either side of the bank. Yeah. All the way down. Yeah. It's beautiful to look at. But. So it's, yeah, but pretty difficult if you've got something to sell, particularly if it was, um, you know. Perishable. Uh, perishable goods. <laughs> yeah. Because you get held up. So that's how it was. So things have changed over time. They've had to change their business model. You no longer get stopped <laughs> by a, a toll at each castle you pass. Reinfeld's castle. Yeah, the extortion <laughs> business protection racket. Um, Reinfeld's castle is now a luxury hotel and restaurant, and it's also a wellness centre. So we're going to go and visit the castle now and straight after that we head straight to Prince Edward Island to meet Janet in Meet the Shepherdess.
on we go, hill for hill and toe for toe. On and on and on we go, up on Barbie's wedding. Plenty herring, plenty meal, plenty pig to fill her creel. Plenty barley buns as well, that's the toast from Barbie. Hello, I'm Janet from Green Gable Alpacas. I own an 11-acre alpaca breeding and fiber production farm in Prince Edward Island, Canada. I started the farm in 2010 when following a family tragedy, I decided to leave city and corporate life behind and I moved halfway across the country to start an alpaca farm. I didn't know a single person on the island when I got here and I had never lived in the country a day in my life. And my plan was that I was going to breed and sell show and seed stock alpacas. And I thought I'd build a little shop and maybe sell my fleece from the shop. Well, that first summer, I decided to open my farm to the public because I didn't know anybody. And I started offering farm tours to anybody who was interested in learning about my animals. Agritourism is now a big part of my business. That's what helped make my business grow. My farm is considered an authentic PI experience, and it's one of probably only a handful of farms across the country that is regularly open to the public. When I first came to the island, I didn't know very much about country living or alpaca farming or very much about fiber or fiber production either, but I had done some research before I got here. And in my research, I knew that alpacas were capable of producing a luxury fiber and that relatively speaking, they were pretty easy to care for. And well, both of those things are true. Um, not all alpacas actually produce a luxury fiber and um, alpacas do have a very unique, they have specific and unique husbandry needs that you're going to need to address if you're hoping to optimize their fiber production. Most folks know that alpacas are native to the South American Andes and that they're descendants of an animal called the vicuña. And the vicuña is considered one of the finest fleeced animals in the world. And alpacas were domesticated probably about 5,000 years ago. And depending on the country you live in, they come in anywhere from probably 15 to 20, year, 20 plus uh, colors, naturally recognized colors. Now they come in two hair types, the Surrey hair type Surrey alpacas have fiber that grows parallel to the skin, almost in ringlets. The other uh, fiber, fiber type is called wakaya. Uh, by far, that's the most common type of alpaca fiber uh, type of alpaca that you're going to find, and those are the kind that I have on my farm. Their fiber grows perpendicular to the skin, and uh, it tends to be crimpy. The good stuff tends to be crimpy, and it's finer, um, and it makes the alpacas kind of look like teddy bears. So most folks think of alpacas as really cute and really cuddly and would really like to be <laughs> like to hug them. Uh, but mostly alpacas are not very affectionate uh, and they mostly don't wish to be touched. And it's not just people that they don't really like to be touched by. They don't really like to be touched by other alpacas either. Alpacas really have personal space issues um, and often they will spit at one another when an animal gets in their personal space. Spitting is a uh, very important part of their communication system, it means back off, you're not respecting my space. Now, despite the, the rumor, um, alpacas don't generally spit at people, unless of course you do something to deserve it, or that animal has been raised inappropriately. If you over socialize uh, alpacas when they're young um, and don't set appropriate boundaries, um, you teach them that alpacas and people are the same. So when they become adults, they, they don't see the difference and they will treat people like alpacas and alpacas don't treat one another very nicely. So that being said, I have been spit on and being spit on is different than being spit at. Uh, every alpaca farmer at one time or another has been spit on. Some of them have been spit at too. Um, I recall the first time it happened for me. I was uh, feeding a group of girls and I guess I got in between two girls who are a little grumpy with one another and I just happened to be <laughs> uh, within range. So I got spit on. 
uh, and it's not fun and it smells and it's yucky and it's green. So I have a herd of about 35 alpacas and I produce about 200 pounds of fiber a year and I'm very fortunate that the majority of my clip is processed into yarn right here on the island by Kim and Jennifer at Fleece and Harmony. So unlike fiber sheep breeds who uh, produce a pretty consistent grade of fiber depending on the breed of sheep, alpacas don't have breeds and the quality of fiber uh, in alpaca herds can vary tremendously. Now fiber characteristics in alpacas is actually highly heritable and it's influenced by genetics and by the environment. Now, the genetics you can't change once the animal has been conceived, but the environments you can affect from year to year. However, you, you can't change the quality of the fleece by adjusting the environment beyond the potential, the genetic potential of the animal. And what I mean by that is you cannot create, create a quality 17 micron fleece from an animal who's only capable of producing a 23 micron fleece. So my goal here on the farm is to produce only the finest grades of fiber and use only the finest grades of fiber in my yarns. Um, so in the fiber world, um, whether you're talking about sheep or alpacas or goats or rabbits or any other fiber bearing animal, the single biggest determinant of fiber value is fiber fineness or fiber grade. And that's measured in microns and you're going to see it noted as AFD or average fiber diameter, or perhaps it might be MFD, mean fiber diameter. And generally the finer the fiber, the more valuable the fiber. So second to fiber diameter in terms of determining fiber value is something called standard deviation. And that's also measured in microns. And standard deviation is a reflection of how uniform um, those measurements are across the sample and across the fleece. So if you think for a minute, if you have a fleece where the, all the fibers are very uniform in terms of fineness, that's going to feel a lot more comfortable against your skin than something that is less uniform. And that would be true even if you have a higher micron fleece. So the two of those, micron and uh, average fiber diameter and standard deviation are really important tools for me, among others, that I use in, um, in making some decisions. Um, I take samples of fiber from every animal every year and I have amassed a database of information on all of my animals and I use that information for decision making. So what I can do is I can look at a cohort of animals of similar age or animals who have a similar pedigree or even an animal over time and using that information I can identify superior animals on my farm and superior fleeces and I can make decisions then. I use that information to make decisions about who I'm going to breed to who, and what fibers I'm going to put together to make yarns. As I said, we shear once a year. Uh, after shearing, I will skirt and sort all of my fleeces, and I, I will sort them, sort the fleeces based on quality of the fiber and the staple length. That's the, the length of the fiber. Uh, I'm not concerned about color at this point. That is, I don't, I don't go through all the fawn fleeces and match all the fawn fleeces, I match fiber based on quality, not on color. And that's similar in terms of what I do for breeding. I don't breed for color, I breed for quality. So uh, I'm interested in making um, uh, luxury yarns. And to do that, I need to ensure that the fibers going into those yarns are as consistent as possible. So I will come up with batches of yarns that I'll then take to Kim and Jennifer at the mill. Once I get to the mill, Kim and I have a discussion about the type of yarns we're going to make for my fiber. And we go through each batch. And based on the unique characteristics of each batch of yarn, we make some decisions about the type of yarn that we're going to make. Uh, for instance, if I've got a batch of yarn, a batch of fleece where the fiber might, might be a little bit shorter, then we know that Kim is going to have to apply a little bit more twist to get that fiber to stay together and to make some yarn. Whereas if I've got a batch of fiber that maybe has a longer staple length, 
um, we can we can spin it maybe not as not as tight and produce a loftier yarn. After Kim and I talk about the types of yarn that we're going to make from my fiber, then I have a conversation with Jennifer about which batches are going to be custom dyed and which which batches are going to re remain natural color. Uh, Jennifer and I have very similar philosophy when it comes to dyeing yarns and we're both quite open to experimenting, which I really love. So one of the things that I really enjoy doing is over dyeing uh, those fawn yarns and those uh, lighter brown yarns. Um, in my experience, um, those yarns are able to produce, over dyeing those colored yarns, uh, you're able to produce a very rich um, tonal yarn that you cannot produce if you're using a base fiber that's white or quite light. Over the years, I've developed a reputation for producing some of the finest fleeces and finest alpaca yarns in the region. And our, my yarns are highly uh, sought after um, and often uh, supply cannot keep up with demand. Um, this year, I've started working with a group of Canadian women who are professional uh, fiber sorters and class classers, and they actually purchase fleeces from uh, small producers across the country. Um, because they're professional sorters and graders, they grade the fiber before sending it to mills around the country and have it spun into yarn. Um, from there, I take it to my dye studio and I custom dye it in a number of different colorways um, uh, that are inspired from all kinds of things around me. And I really enjoy that. By working with these ladies out west, I'm now able to build my inventory of yarns and while at the same time maintaining my standards for producing only high quality yarns. And I'm able to say that I know the grade of fiber in every skein of my yarn. This year represents my 10th year in business. And as I look back and reflect, I'm amazed at how much my life has been enriched by my time and my experiences here on the island. Whether it's learning how to heat my house with wood only, um, tending to and nursing back to health a sick Kriya, or teaching myself how to spin or how to knit, I'm really amazed <laughs> at how my life has changed since I've been here. And when I look at look back at what my life was like back in the corporate world, <laughs> um, I can honestly say that I'm very grateful to be here. This is exactly where I'm supposed to be and exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And I have a lot of fun with my animals and with fiber, and I'm really looking forward to the next 10 years. enjoyed that segment yeah I thought it was really interesting she had lots to say she has a lot of expertise there yeah she does yeah she's obviously she's just a remarkable woman she's obviously intelligent and very gutsy and I think she's been able to just um, transfer her research and organizational skills from her previous corporate job straight into farming which is quite probably quite a different domain yeah, yeah. but it's I think she's probably used the same kind of thinking processes yep. to make it successful because it's pretty hard to do that relatively you know later later on in your life most yep. people gain their knowledge farming knowledge from being brought up in the area yeah yeah so and not only has she made a successful business but she's also uh, become a bit of an expert in breeding our packets for fiber which is really cool and we were really looking forward to meeting Janet in person at the Prince Edward Fiber Festival which was going to happen in September but it's been cancelled because of covid so that's really sad yep. but it'll happen next year 
And I think just businesses like Janet's that really rely on the tourist industry are probably really suffering, which is, is just terrible. So if you have been curious about trying an 100% alpaca yarn maybe this is a really good opportunity for you to have a go especially because Janet's yarns you'll know that because of her expertise in fiber that the the yarns are made from really top quality alpaca fiber and I think that makes a big difference because mm -hmm. that's what Toft was talking about as well yep. you can get such a range in alpaca fibers that you certainly don't want to get the low the low grade yeah yeah and the colors were just beautiful just really sophisticated that's what I thought I think they're stunning colors yeah. yeah so. Okay, so Janet is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 15% discount of all her yarns. Janet's yarns come in a two-ply fingering weight, DK weight, a four-ply worsted weight, and a four-ply bulky weight. And all of them are 100% alpaca. And like I said, they just come in stunning, stunning colours. So thank you so much to Janet. If you're watching the show, we do ask that you make a small regular contribution by becoming a patron because this is our full-time job and we don't receive an income from anything else related on the side. So we're not selling anything and we don't receive money from sponsorship or advertising. The show is only possible through patron support and every single patron makes a really big difference to us. So if you are watching, please do become a patron. And we're so grateful to the viewers who have done that step and, and become patrons and allowed the show to continue. So thank you very much. Yep. Now we want to announce a new cull. It's a pretty spontaneous decision, but as some of you will know, Alistair Post Quinn, who is the double knitting expert that we interviewed very recently in episode 99, has just had a pretty horrible thing happen to him. He's lost his home and his studio in a massive fire. So all of his samples and all of his yarn were destroyed in the fire. And you can see here, he's holding up some of his very beautiful, beautiful, stunning designs, which just take hours and hours to knit. They were all destroyed as well in the fire and he uses these designs to teach with. So you can imagine that Alistair is absolutely devastated. So we thought we want to help him and if you would like to help him as well and learn double knitting at the same time, you can go to his Ravelry store and buy a pattern and enter our knit along. So we're going to call the knit along Support Alistair Double Knitting Knit Along. Now that is a really long name, but it is just descriptive and you know what it's about. He no longer sells his books, but you can get most of his patterns at his Ravelry store. So three years ago, I had to take a complete break from my knitting because I developed pains that just weren't going away in both of my elbows. Now, some of our viewers have been asking me to give an update on how I'm going now and what are some of the things that I did to recover. And since this is the topic or subject of our feature interview, I thought this is a really good time for me to quickly share my experience. So, like I said, I had strong pains on both, in both my arms at my elbows that just weren't going away and I was diagnosed with a, a mild but chronic form of golfer's elbow which is also called medial epicondylitis and that's where the tendon on the forearm muscle it develops where the tendon on the forearm muscle attaches to the bony part on the inside of your elbows so it happens right here now tendons don't have a strong blood flow through them like muscles do so they take a lot lot longer to heal and so it's a really long process and, and very frustrating process. But in the end, for me, there were just three things that really, really helped. Now, everything that I'm telling you is all anecdotal. So if you're in pain yourself, don't go ahead and diagnose yourself based on what I have to say. And also don't go and try these exercises if you're in pain because they really may not be appropriate for you. You need to see a doctor or a physiotherapist first. I actually ended up going to quite a few specialists and trying a few different uh, therapies, but in the end it was these three things that really helped me. So the first thing was taking a, a long break, and for me that was three months. But that in itself wouldn't have been a final solution because if I'd only taken a break and then gone back to knitting, the pains would have come back again. But it was the starting process and that was really good. But the second thing I did, that was really the best thing I did. And I found out about that in a really unusual way. It was 
when we were having a Christmas break in Snowdonia and we were sitting in a cafe and one of the local doctors came in and she sat down at our table and she started talking to us. And she is a mad keen kayaker. Now everywhere in Snowdonia you have all these adventurous types and they're mad keen sports people of one sort or another. And we, we love to go there because we hope it kind of rubs off on us a bit. Yeah. Osmosis. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, for her, not being able to kayak was the same as for us not being able to knit. So pretty difficult devastating she developed the same as what I had like a, a very chronic form of golfer's elbow because of kayaking but there was one exercise that really helped her and she told me about it so what I had to do was strengthen the non-contractile part of my forearm muscle here and you do that by lengthening the forearm muscle under tension and that just means slowly lengthening the forearm muscle with a weight and that is called eccentric strengthening. Now I've put those names up on the screen if you want to know about them in a lot more detail just google those names and it'll tell you a lot more about it. So back in episode 26 I first showed you how I did this and I started back then with the weight of a wine bottle. So you can see that I support my forearm on the edge of the sofa and I start with my wrist curled right up and then really slowly you lower your, your wrist and you can count to 10 so as slow as possible and this is lengthening the muscle under the tension of the weight of a wine bottle. And I did this back then every day for about five minutes increasing it till about 10 minutes and now I go to Kieser training which is a German high intensity strength training method and there's a machine there which exercises my muscles in exactly the same way. So Germany is completely opened up now, including all of the gyms and the training centres. But when we were in lockdown and I couldn't go to the gym and I wasn't exercising this muscle for quite a few weeks, I noticed that the pain started to come back again. So I had to make myself a makeshift weight to be able to keep doing this exercise at home. So here it is. It's my toft bag and inside are six cans of leftover dog food. So I'm so much stronger now that a wine bottle doesn't do it for me anymore. I've moved on from wine. I'm now on to the dog food. <laughs> That's not a progression I would have thought of, actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And this dog food is really quite heavy, but it really works for me. So when I do this regularly, I can literally knit for hours at a time. And you can see that I'm just doing it in the same, uh, same way. So it's a little bit more uncomfortable holding a heavy bag strap than it is holding a bottle of wine, but it works in the same way. And I'm just lowering my, my wrist just as slowly in the same way. There's one more thing I want to quickly tell you about that was a significant help for me. And this, again, I received in an odd way. One of our viewers sent me a YouTube clip of a German doctor showing me a, um, showing a special stretching exercise. Now, I can't remember who the viewer is, so I can't say thank you. But if you are still watching, thank you very much. And the YouTube clip I've also lost, so I can't even give you a link to it in the show notes. But it would only help you if you could understand German. But it was of a German doctor showing how to do this stretching exercise. So here I am doing it and you can either do it down by getting down on all fours or you can do it on a flat surface like leaning over a table like I'm doing and you do it with your wrist turned back just like you see me doing and you need to stretch in this position for at least three to four minutes and I sometimes even did up to five minutes and you really need to lean into that stretch as much as you can. The most significant part of the exercise is the time that you need to do it for because this German doctor said that if you do anything under two and a half to three minutes it wasn't going to make a difference and I found that to be true for me. At the end you feel like your fingers are actually going to drop off, you feel like you get lots of pins and needles in them but the very next day I just noted that I did this, I noticed such a big difference so it really is the time that you're doing it. But now I have to say that some people have very loose joints and doing something like this is actually very bad for them so again if you don't diagnose yourself based on me Go to your doctor and talk about it and let them say yes or no yep. as to whether it's appropriate for you. So that's my anecdotal experience. And but the main thing I want to tell you is that if you're feeling really frustrated, don't give up. There is hope. And if even if you've tried some therapies and they don't work for you, don't give up. 
Just keep looking. Be determined and you'll find a way. That's a really the big message that I found. Yeah. Because I'd been to specialists, I'd tried stuff and it just wasn't working properly. But there is hope. You just have to believe there's a solution and, and you'll find it eventually. Yeah. You, I, know, you know that some portion of our viewers have already gone off to buy dog food. <laughs> But just go carefully. You want to start with the wine bottle. <laughs> yeah. yeah, try buying some wine first. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's my anecdotal evidence. Now you, comes the interview that you've all been waiting for with the real expert on this subject, and that's with Carson Demers. Carson is just a wonderful, compassionate person, so you'll really enjoy his interview. And I think one of he's a compassionate person by nature, but he's also been through this himself he's actually done rehab therapy for a repetitive strain injury himself so he really understands the frustration and the fear that people have as you know maybe i can never do what i really love again and that is significantly fearful and and yeah. and, and other things i mean these things don't necessarily just hit your knitting yeah, it yeah. It can make it exactly. hard to do other things in life, so yeah. it's really important. So he's very understanding for yeah. that. His book has helped a lot of people. Um, it's it's had rave reviews. And I'm just really grateful that there is a book about this subject that's really aimed at our niche market. So that's brilliant. Carson is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 10% discount off his book when you purchase it from his online shop and his website. So all the details for this patron discount are on the Fruity Knitting patron site. So if you would like to get his book, you should go to his website first. You can either buy it from his online store or he'll have a list of stockists there that, that might be closer to you and you can order it there. Yeah. So coming up right now is the interview with Carson. So enjoy that. We've really enjoyed having your company today. So thanks for being with us. We'll see you in two weeks time. Bye. Bye. to Fruity Knitting. The worldwide lockdown that most of the world has been going through these last couple of months is totally unprecedented historically. It's been an extremely challenging time for many people for many different reasons. Now for crafters being locked in with their stash could seem like a blessing because finally they have endless time to work on all the exciting projects and they also have a soothing activity to help take their minds off deeper worries. But this extra knitting time can also be the source of new problems, injuries through too much knitting. Now, three years ago, back in episode 31, we interviewed the physiotherapist Carson Demers, who's a very keen knitter and spinner himself, and he had just released his book, Knitting Comfortably, The Ergonomics of Hand Knitting. Now, we're really lucky to have Carson join us again to share his expert advice, which is particularly relevant right now during the lockdown. So welcome, Carson. It's really great to have you on Fruity Knitting again. Oh, thank you so much. It's great to be back. So Carson, for the viewers who haven't seen our first interview, can you give us a bit of background about yourself as a physiotherapist and how your book came into being and the reception that it's had in the fibre world since its publication in 2016? Sure. Um, so I've been a physical therapist now for about 30 years and about 20 years ago, um, I, I sustained some repetitive strain injuries myself, some cumulative trauma injuries myself, and it was due to faulty office ergonomics. And before you judge me harshly, remember that 20 years ago, we didn't have the kind of adaptable equipment that we do today for office work. So it was a very, very challenging situation um, in terms of the physical environment. And so much so that I actually couldn't practice PT, I couldn't work with patients for a couple of years. Um, during that time, what I experienced uh, while I was going through my rehab was a lot of, you know, functional loss and just a, a real sense of, of being afraid of will I be able to go back to my passion and treating my patients. And um, I, I was also a knitter and at the time couldn't knit and that's pretty scary all, all by itself. So it was a very difficult time. Um, 
I got very passionate about ergonomics and I started learning as much as I could during that two year rehab period and got back into the clinic and suddenly started seeing patients coming in who were knitters who had the same physical problems, the musculoskeletal problems that I had just worked so hard to rehab. And I had a great deal of compassion for these people because the, the root cause of all this was a lack of knowledge. These injuries are incredibly preventable and they're very, um, very fixable for the most part if you catch them early. And I decided as a physical therapist that I could reach more people by writing a book than by waiting for them to come to the clinic. And I'd much rather have them prevent an injury than actually sustain the injury. So the book came out actually in 2017. Um, we're now in the third printing of the book. It's done tremendously well. Uh, for such a kind of geeky little niche topic, it's done tremendously well. Um, probably about 10,000 copies have sold. Um, but the best, you know, and it's gotten terrific reviews. It's got a great got a great review in Vogue. It got a great review from the Knitters Review. Lots of really wonderful reviewers. Uh, Mason Dixon, lots of folks who've reviewed it. But for me, the best part of the book is the feedback that I get from its readers. Um, when I come across a, a student or someone who's, you know, I meet at a show, because um, I teach all over the place where I was before this COVID uh, started happening, and they'll come up and they'll tell me, I couldn't knit before, or I could only knit for five minutes, and then I couldn't pick it up again for a week, and I'm now able to knit comfortably, and I can knit for hours, or, you know, even, an hour longer than I was before. I mean, it just, it fills my heart with joy and it's just such a wonderful thing to be able to contribute. Definitely, and even being able to knit one extra hour a day is a, a big achievement, I know that. So can you just quickly outline the content of your book, what you cover? So this is what the book looks like. And um, the, first, uh, the first couple of chapters go, go over some very basic information about ergonomics. Um, there's a chapter in there about what, what is it about human anatomy that makes us vulnerable to injuries. And then the next five chapters apply that to the forces that are found in the process of knitting. Um, I give very knitterly examples throughout the book, although uh, I really do keep the, the tone of the book very non-clinical. It's very accessible. I've, I work really hard to make it very knitterly and very approachable. Um, after we go through learning where the risks are, and those chapters also talk about ways that you can mitigate the risk, reduce the risk um, for more sustainable knitting and more comfortable knitting, the book then goes on to talk about tools. There's a whole chapter on all the different kinds of tools that we use as knitters, um, pros and cons, how to select them, that sort of thing. Um, there's a chapter on self-care and early intervention so that you'll know if that kind of twinge you're feeling is really something to pay attention to um, and maybe start taking care of or if it's really okay to not worry so much about it. Um, and then the things to do. There's a, a several pages of exercises. Uh, there's a chapter on setting up your home office and computing areas as knitters and especially during this time where we're spending so much more time on the computer for work and working from home and meetings. Um, the muscles that are used for computing are the same muscles that we use for knitting, so they're getting a lot of work out these days, and this talks about it. And then the book wraps up with a chapter on implementation and some strategies for making all these things uh, kind of integrated into your daily experience. And uh, the book is filled with lots of photographs. It's really well illustrated. You probably can't see from there. Of course, I'm flipping to pages that don't have illustrations on them. But uh, yeah, full color illustrations and drawings and um, did a really interesting thing with the, with the art in the book, which is we have photographs, but then we have, as you can see on the cover, we have um, an, artist, an artist rendering of the muscle over the top of the book, so over the top of the photograph. So you get a sense of what's actually happening under there while you're doing the work. So that's, that's what the book is about. So increased knitting and crafting time can lead to extra aches and pains, particularly during the lockdown, because you're probably also not exercising as much as you normally do. Can you explain the problems that are going on there a bit more and then talk about the main muscle groups that need to stay strong and support all the fine muscle movements that are used in repetitive knitting and crafting? Sure. The key word here is exposure. Um, to start with, there's always risk in, 
And when I say risk, I'm, I'm talking about uh, forces being applied to tissue, which presents risk to it. Um, it's present in everything, everyday life, everything that we do. But when we increase our exposure to it, particularly from one kind of thing, it puts more strain on the tissue and it can lead to some problems. In knitting in particular, we are sort of inherently have a lot of bad habits that are baked into the way that we knit. And, and a lot of them uh, stem from faulty postures in, in just the way that we've selected our chair, maybe the way that we're sitting. And so how this, how this can affect a knitter uh, directly is that while we're knitting, we don't really use our core muscles, do we? Most of the work is done with the muscles of the forearm, the hand. And so we tend to have these muscle groups that, that are put in rather awkward postures where they don't have a, a mechanical advantage for contraction. And I'm going to speak specifically about the intrascapular muscles, the ones between your shoulder blades, so that their job is to support the weight of your arm. But if you've got your arms too far in front of you, then those muscles are not able to contract. They're elongated, and they're not going to be as strong in that elongated position. So what it tends to do is cause more tissue breakdown back there, and we experience that physically as those knots and those aches that sometimes we'll, we'll feel in between our shoulder blades. Um, other parts of our body that, as knitters that, that can really kind of get overstressed from this is um, the neck, and we should really talk about the neck a little bit, particularly the muscles of the upper trap and the back of the neck, because most knitters like to work with their heads down looking at their work, and that puts a tremendous amount of strain on these cervical discs, it puts a tremendous amount of strain on the um, upper trap muscles and the cervical muscles as well. When you add to this, um, not just the forces of knitting, but other things that are happening to our bodies, um, we are, during the, the lockdown, we're, we're probably less active than we were before, we're probably spending more time on computers um, in the same postures as we do with knitting uses the, using the same muscle group. So the exposure to these forces is tremendously higher. Add to that another layer, which is just the layer of physical aging. And, it, and if you haven't been a person who's really actively kept these muscles strong and flexible, um, you're, you're really just adding more and more strain, more force to the tissue. And eventually it'll start to complain. It'll start to give you some discomfort, some aches and pains and twinges and, and all those other kinds of things that we hear knitters complain about. Okay, so what are some good exercises that knitters can do at home to strengthen these appropriate muscles and, and uh, prevent deconditioning? So I think the best place for us to start um, to look at that question, Andrea, is to look at the neck. And I always get very concerned um, about knitters' necks um, because we spend so much time with our heads, our heads down. We, yeah. These days with smartphones, we spend a lot of time with our head down. And I want to just show you on this model why that's concerning. So our, our spine has these natural curves, which we, we hear so much about. And these curves are there for a very good reason. These curves help us to absorb force. They, they work as a spring when we're walking and even when we're sitting, when we're bearing weight through our spine. It helps to take force off so that we don't end up with a lot of force happening in, in our brain, right? Well. When we change the shape of this to reduce the curve, as I've just done in the neck, this can no longer absorb that force. So the force goes somewhere else. And in this case, it goes to these structures on the front part of the spine. You can see them. These are the, these are the discs in your back. These discs are very aqueous. They don't have a blood supply. They rely on pressure gradients. Uh, to compress moisture out and to release and allow moisture to come back in. When we spend a lot of time in this head down position, we load the discs and a full head down position can put about 60 pounds of force on these discs. That's a lot of force. And think about how long you're in that posture, not just knitting, but using your smartphone. If you look at your keys when you're typing, all those, all those times that we spend with our head down. Now the result of that is a really complicated consequence because next to these, uh, adjacent to these discs is where the, the nerves come out of our neck and they travel down into our, into our hands and arms. And so we'll sometimes hear people complain, I get numbness in my hands, I get numbness in my arms, I have these 
burning pains along the edge of my shoulder blade. And those are classic signs that could be originating from problems up here in the discs of your neck. So the first exercise that I want to show people is a way to unload the discs. And the first thing that I would say is, for heaven's sake, look up once in a while when you're knitting. <laughs> you know, in my book, I, <laughs> right? There's a beautiful world out there. In my book, I have these um, little activities. They're called swatch opportunities, and there are ways that you can improve technique by... Um, I have a whole philosophy about swatching, but I look at it as our knitter's rehearsal space. And so going into that rehearsal space, the first thing I have you work on is not watching your hands as you knit. So coming yeah. up with a, a head forward position, we're going to tuck our chin, and, and a chin tuck will activate the muscles, the extensor muscles, so it'll shorten them, help them to get stronger because they're very stretched out when our heads are down. So what we'll do is slide our chin back to that very unflattering double chin look, <laughs> hold it for a second or two, and then relax. Now, if you're sitting in a posture that's very slumped, bring yourself up nice and tall, get your shoulder blades back and in your back pockets. And then again, just tucking the chin and releasing. And tucking and releasing. Very simple, nice thing to do every 20 minutes or so, certainly if you're feeling some twinges. And I want to stress that this is not a looking up, it's a gliding back. Very different movement than that. The next um, group of muscles that we tend to see as problematic for knitters are the muscles in the forearm. There's a lot of reasons for this. A lot of it has to do with the way we're tensioning our yarn, the way we're holding our needles, how much force is required to do those two things. So most knitters, um, just by virtue of having to hold on to the needles in some fashion, will get some tightness in the forearm muscles here. So we're going to do a stretch to address that. All of these stretches should be done only if you know that they're safe for you. So obviously if you have a problem in your forearm, your wrist, your hand, that would preclude you from doing them, then don't try them. Um, and they should always be done very gently. So don't think of this as yoga or physical therapy where we're really trying to increase range of motion. The goal of these exercises is to take you from sort of a congested, contracted position and just elongate the tissue very gently. So we're gonna start by making a stop sign with our hand and then gently holding our fingers and bringing them back towards you. And you can hold this for maybe five or six seconds. And then you can turn your hand over and you'll feel the stretch biased on the other side of your forearm. And it feels quite lovely for me this morning. I did a bit of late night knitting. And then you can switch over and do the other side. So the straighter your elbow is with this, the more stretch you get out of it. And if you're not sure of that, that just try bending your elbow and you'll feel the stretch will often just disappear and then turn the palm over. Now in classes, when I have people turn the palm over, sometimes I get a lot of confused looks about how to do it. So if that's too confusing, you can just pretend you're holding a bird and then just gently let the bird fly. So it might be a little easier for people to do. So that's a nice gentle stretch for the forearm flexor muscles. We also get a lot of tension in the forearm extensor muscles, and I see this in particular with um, uh, some challenged tensioning techniques and, um, and positions where our wrists are extended. So these are the, this is the muscle group that will extend your wrist, extend your fingers. Um, you'll sometimes see people tensioning their yarn with their, with their finger extended and or with their wrist extended to get even more uh, tension on the yarn, and that requires a constant contraction in this tissue. So I want to show you a, an easy stretch that just feels super good. Um, this position of wrist up is also really common among computer users, especially if you're used to using a laptop um, and or a, a traditional mouse out to the side because the mouse tends to have a higher elevation than the keyboard. So it's kind of a faulty design that puts you in this position just to start. Why are we concerned about this? Because we don't want to get a tendonitis at the elbow and we want to make sure that the carpal tunnel doesn't have any problems and, and it can lead to both of those things. So let me show you this stretch. We're going to start 
in a sort of sleepwalking position and then make very soft fists. And then we're going to turn the fists out, which is just the nicest stretch. And then we're going to sit up nice and tall and bring the hands behind your back, opening up your chest and, and try getting your fists together behind you. Get a nice big stretch across your chest and across the front of your shoulders. Take a breath and let it out. I'll show you again. We're going to start with a sleepwalking position. Make very soft fists, not squeezing tightly, just closing my fingers. Turn them out. Sit up nice and tall. Bring them behind you. Bring your fists together and take a nice big breath. Let it out and relax. It's always nice to shake your hands out after you've done a stretch like that any kind of stretch with your forearms. And the next stretch that I'd like to show you is actually more of a, it's more of a tendon glide and a neural glide than it is an actual stretch. And the reason I've chosen this one to show you is because it helps to make sure that the tendons in your hand and particularly uh, the flexors as they're going through your carpal tunnel are gliding properly. So um, it's kind of a funny looking little stretch but I'll, or glide, but I'll show you. So we're gonna start with our stop sign position. And then we're going to bring the tips of our fingers to the top of the palm of your hand. So you've made a little claw. That's position one. Position two, bring your fingers to the bottom of your palm. So we've made sort of a flat claw. Position three, we make a soft fist. And position four, we open wide. So let's walk through it again. We start with the stop sign. Position one, fingers to the top of the palm. Position two, fingers to the bottom of the palm. Position three, a soft fist. And position four, an open hand. I'm gonna show it to you from the side so that you're clear on the positioning of the fingertips. Position one, position two. We have a little table across our knuckles. Position three, a soft fist and position four is an open hand. So you can do this with both hands simultaneously if you want to. And I always think that it's fun to just end with some finger stretches, jazz hands, get some circulation back there. So, right, jazz hands are always appropriate <laughs> for knitters. I feel quite sleepy now after doing those exercises. <laughs> That's great. So I think it's important to understand that much of the work and stress that's put on our tissue starts with our pelvic posture and our spinal posture. So I wanna bring back our model of the spine. And we talked about the curves before. I want you to understand that when you sit down, your pelvis tilts under and we've lost this curve. And when we've lost this curve, our spine becomes very C-shaped. Now everything that we talked about with the discs up here is happening with the discs down here. But even more generally than that, we've closed our posture down. And when we close our posture down like that, it changes the way that we have to position our shoulders, our elbows, our hands, everything changes as a result of that. So one of the best things that you can do to stay away from any of this, uh, these kinds of problems is to have good pelvic alignment when you're sitting. What does good pelvic alignment mean? It means that when you're sitting, you've retained the curve in your low back. And an easy way to do that is, first of all, sitting on something that's appropriate that will support you there, a firmer chair. Or if, if you don't have a really firm chair, you can use um, uh, some sort of a, I use, usually show my class how to do it with a towel, something to kind of prop your pelvis up back here so that you've, you've got this curve in your back. Once you have the curve, you can support the curve with another cushion but you've got to get that pelvis in the right place first. Now remember, and I hope it's clear from this conversation, that the root cause of all this is a chair. And <laughs> knitters, knitting was designed to be done standing, walking. It's not necessarily a sitting down activity and was designed as a way that you could make fabrics on the go. And it, it's perfect for that. There's nothing lovelier than taking a walk in the park or on the beach 
um, and, and knitting a sock or a hat or something while you're going. So it, it reduces, it, it eliminates all those awkward postures right off the bat and I hope you'll get that a go. They're really good uh, tips, Carson. Thanks so much. And it's just great to see a spine, actually. It does remind you um, exactly how you're meant to sit and what's comfortable. Uh, that's true. I, I definitely feel like I'm so much more comfortable when I've got uh, a cushion in the, in the small of my back. So, Carson, in your book, you also have some uh, mitigation strategies with your actual knitting to decrease the risk of injury. So what are some of those? Yes, thank you. So there are lots of different things that we can do um, as mitigation strategies. And one of the simplest things that you can do is project pairing. Project pairing looks at the project environment of the piece that you're working on, and it matches it with a project that has different properties to it. So it's all about bringing diversity into a system that could otherwise be very homogenous. So for example, this is a piece of Shetland lace that I'm working on, and obviously very fine yarn, pretty small needle. Um, lots of hand movement because um, even, even though it's Shetland lace, there, there are double decreases and triple decreases and uh, you know all the, all the fiddly bits of working with lace. And a nice pairing with this is this other project oops, that I'm working on. This is a will be a lopy jacket. So I'm working on a very bulky yarn. It's quite different than the Shetland yarn. It's very toothy yarn, right? It's got a lot of a lot of grab to it. So it's offering me more friction, but it's just plain knit stitches, and they're yeah. large. And so what does that do for me? It means that my hands are in different positions, different amounts of grip to support the larger needle versus the smaller needle. This is a more open project. The lace is a tighter project for your hands. So that's one thing that you can do um, is pair your projects differently based on gauge. You can also pair them differently based on fiber type. Working with some fibers that are slippery and other fibers that are grippy, making sure that you've matched the right needle for that. But just uh, the difference in elasticity of projects and, and of the fibers themselves is a way that you can kind of um, bring in some diversity into your work. And the third way that we would do this would be to take a look at the challenge, the level of challenge of the project. Um, exposure is based on three things, frequency, duration, and intensity. And so yeah. the more difficult stitches, more difficult projects, it's often nice to pair those with a project that's a little bit simpler, easier on your body. And if you, like me, are a multi-craft person, I will pair my knitting projects with spinning projects um, and I have the same kind of dialogue going on between those, those two areas so I can change up the forces that I'm experiencing at any, at, with any different project. That's great. Now, I'm a really intensive monogamous person. I kind of just like to get stuck on one thing and just go at it. <laughs> so what can you say for monogamous knitters? Yeah, so those those monogamous are very interesting people. I wish I <laughs> I wish I could be one. Um, so for the monogamous, um, if you're knitting different projects but only one at a time, and those projects are varying with gauge, uh, complexity of stitches, fiber types, I don't think that you have a lot to worry about. Um, I would look more at how long you're spending on each of those. If you're sitting down for four hours and knitting you know, diligently on a project, you want to space that up with some breaks and some stretches for, for sure, because it's all about breaking up any kind of monotony. If you're the kind of monogamous knitter who just likes to do one kind of project, socks with superwash merino, um, that's a different set of problems, because now your diet's very limited to one kind of fiber, one kind of gauge. So breaking that up um, would possibly expanding it to different fibers, but if you're not keen to do that, you could easily add some exercises, some more frequent stretches, stretches to break up the, um, the kind of repetitiveness, the frequency and duration of exposure to that kind of yarn at that kind of gauge. Yeah. Now, something else that we can all do to kind of break this monotony up um, and, and truly mitigate some of the problems that we're having is to go to what I call the, the knitter's rehearsal zone, which is a swatch. And I know that that's a dirty word for a lot of knitters. <laughs> um, a lot, of, a lot of knitters don't like the idea of swatching, but it really is a place for us to do some rehearsing 
And what I mean by that is it's a place for us to practice ergonomic techniques, certainly. Um, it's a place for us to practice the stitches and the mistakes and repair of stitches that we're going to see in our projects. So you can look at those as little micro projects, little warm-up activities, just like before you went for a run, you'd probably do some, I hope, some warm-up exercise and some stretch. These little five-minute swatches um, can be a nice way for you to mitigate problems by undoing the bad habits before you actually get into the meat of the work. Yeah. Okay, there's some definitely some good tips. And I know for myself, if I have a long stocking stitch uh, section, sometimes I can, I'll just change from uh, knitting English flicking to some continental or something like that, and that just gives you a little break. That's And you've got that also in your book as well. Okay, now just to finish off, I'd like us to talk a little bit about the mind-body connection because a lot of people are, are pretty stressed right now. And when you're emotionally stressed, that can definitely affect the tension in your knitting. But also subconsciously, it just sends tension right throughout your body and it can come out in quite surprising ways. You know, sometimes it's hard to immediately recognize that something is actually um, an emotionally stressed trigger or it's been triggered from emotional stress that comes out in a physical way. So can you just, can we end with some of your final thoughts on the mind-body connection? Yeah, that's a great thing to talk about. So, you know, to start with when we're, when we are experiencing this emotional stress, it really is a very primal response. It, it sort of brings up our fight or flight mechanism that elevates cortisol levels in our body and it makes us more susceptible to discomfort. Your brain can actually and will actually change its, its chemistry and register these, these signals that used to not be pain as pain. You can, and there's lots of studies out there that show how the brain can kind of remap itself. So we're living in a time when this is the, this is the, the background noise for our existence these days. And we're taking comfort and refuge in our knitting projects. And we like to think that this is a place that is a, a totally free zone. And um, as we've discussed, there are still forces that are happening. And now they're happening on this other layer, this other layer of, of fight or flight. So it's important for us to be aware of that and to check in with our bodies frequently. My, my best advice to you is a technique that I use called a mindfulness marker and I use uh, another kind of marker called a movement marker. And it's simply a marker that you put on your work. And when you encounter it coming, on, coming around your needle, um, it's an opportunity or a reminder to pause, check in with your body, take a deep breath, be mindful of your physical alignment, be mindful of how your hands and arms are feeling. Uh, is it time for a drink of water? Um, a movement marker can do a similar thing, but when you encounter the movement marker, that's your cue to do an exercise, to do a stretch or change your position, move to another side of the room. So there's some ways that we can actually build this in very organically into our knitting. But what I think, what I think is so important about it is we have to understand that there is a very strong connection between the mind and the body. And I think that knitters have probably experienced this maybe more than many groups, and it's usually around holiday knitting time when we're so busy and so focused on being productive that we tend to ignore those little aches and pains until the holidays are over. And that's when I start seeing a lot of uh, people complaining of sore arms and sore muscles and sore necks and what have you, because once the threat is over and you can pay attention to your body again, uh, or you start paying attention to your body again, you start to notice it even more. So we can, we can outsmart the old brain and we can add mindfulness to our knitting and really help to uh, prevent any of that from happening in the first place. Well, Carson, it's been so good to have you on Fruity Knitting again. I've actually, I've really enjoyed our interview. I've actually felt quite relaxed and first of all, doing those exercises and then hearing your soothing voice. I reckon the viewers are feeling the same thing. So we really, really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your expertise and um, just getting new viewers to be aware of your book, which will definitely help them from um, potential injuries. And like you said in your book, often people don't think it's going to happen to them. They think, oh, I'm too young, or I've been knitting like this for a long time. It's not going to happen to me. And it's just good to be aware of that. And because it's, you really don't want to be in the situation when you need to calm yourself with knitting and you can't. <laughs>
<laughs> Absolutely right. Yeah. It's been great being here, Andrea. Thank you so much for having me back. Oh, great. Okay, well, let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.